Picture this. It's 2005, and Airbus unveils what they call the future of aviation, the A380. Double-decked, massive, capable of carrying over 800 passengers. The largest passenger aircraft ever built. Airlines around the world are placing orders. Emirates, Singapore, British Airways, Lufthansa. The excitement is palpable. This is going to change everything. But there's one glaring absence from the order books. The United States of America. Not a single American airline, not United, not American, not Delta, placed an order for the world's most impressive passenger jet. In an industry where bigger often meant better, where airlines competed for the most luxurious flying experiences, American carriers took one look at the A380 and said, no thanks. Was this the biggest mistake in aviation history? Or did American Airlines see something everyone else missed? Today, we're diving deep into one of commercial aviation's most fascinating mysteries. Why did the world's largest aviation market completely reject what was supposed to be the aircraft of the future? The answer isn't what you think, and it reveals something profound about how American aviation works differently from the rest of the world. Let's start with what everyone thought they knew about the A380's failure. Too big, too expensive, bad timing. But here's what's really shocking. American Airlines never even seriously considered it. This wasn't about economics going wrong after they bought it. They saw the specs, analyzed the numbers, and rejected the entire concept before it left the drawing board. What did they see that others didn't? The hub strategy that never made sense. Here's the first clue. When American Airlines VP of Network Planning Vazu Raja was asked about the A380 in 2019, his response was brutal in its clarity. The reality is that we don't just funnel all of our traffic into one hub. We operate out of nine different hubs in the US. And because of that, there's no single hub where you can pool 500 people's worth of demand every single day. Think about what he's saying. American Airlines doesn't just have one massive hub. They have nine. United has eight major hubs. Delta spreads operations across Atlanta, Minneapolis, Detroit, Seattle, and more. Now compare that to Emirates, the A380's biggest success story. They operate exclusively through Dubai. Every passenger, every route, everything flows through that single point. Why does this matter? Because the A380 was designed around a very specific business model. The hub and spoke system taken to its absolute extreme. Take thousands of passengers from around the world, concentrate them at a single mega hub, then distribute them to final destinations. It's elegant on paper. But American aviation evolved completely differently. When the US deregulated its airline industry in 1978, something fascinating happened. Instead of concentrating operations, airlines spread them out. Competition drove them to offer more flights, more frequently, to more places. Passengers wanted options. Business travelers demanded flexibility. The market rewarded frequency over capacity. United CFO John Rainey captured this philosophy perfectly. Instead of one flight a day and fill up an A380, we'd rather serve a market with a couple wide bodies if the demand was there because business passengers certainly like that. One flight per day versus multiple daily departures. Capacity versus frequency. It's a fundamental difference in how American Airlines think about serving customers. And the A380 was built for the capacity model. The infrastructure nightmare. But let's say American Airlines wanted to overcome the hub problem. Maybe they could have made it work somehow. Well, there was another massive barrier waiting. Infrastructure. The A380 isn't just big. It's so big that most airports can't handle it without expensive modifications. How expensive? A Government Accountability Office study found that just 18 U.S. airports estimated they'd need $927 million in total infrastructure changes to accommodate the A380 nearly a billion dollars for 18 airports. JFK needed $151 million in modifications. LAX required $85.8 million. Miami wanted $97.5 million. These weren't optional upgrades. The A380's 261-foot wingspan demanded gates spaced farther apart. Its 200-foot width requirement meant runway expansions. The aircraft's 80-foot height needed specialized ground equipment that didn't exist. Here's what's really telling. Today in 2025, only 16 US airports have FAA approved modifications to handle A380 operations, 16. 
out of hundreds of commercial airports, that means American Airlines would be locked into a tiny fraction of their existing route network. For airlines operating distributed hub strategies, this was catastrophic. Imagine trying to run United's network through just 16 airports. It would eliminate dozens of profitable routes, force passengers through unnecessary connections, and destroy the operational flexibility that American carriers depend on. Emirates can afford this limitation because they only need Dubai to work perfectly. American carriers need their aircraft to operate seamlessly across vast, diverse networks. The A380's infrastructure requirements made that impossible. The math that didn't add up. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Even if American Airlines could solve the hub problem and pay for infrastructure modifications, the economics still didn't work. The A380's operating costs reached $25,000 to $35,000 per flight hour, with fuel alone costing up to $13,000 per hour. That sounds expensive, but here's the thing. On a per-seat basis, the A380 could actually be efficient. If you could fill all 500-plus seats consistently, the problem? American Airlines typically operate at 75 to 78 percent load factors. The A380 needed 85 percent or higher just to break even. Emirates achieves 90 to 100 percent load factors on A380 routes, but they're funneling traffic from three continents through a single hub. American carriers spread similar traffic across multiple hubs, multiple routes, multiple daily flights. There's no way to consistently achieve those load factors in a distributed network. The acquisition costs made it even worse. The A380 cost $445 to $450 million per aircraft. Compare that to a Boeing 777-300ER at around $320 million. For the price of two A380s, you could buy three 777s, spread them across different routes, and achieve much better network utilization. But here's the kicker. While airlines were debating whether to buy A380s, Boeing was quietly revolutionizing the market with something completely different. The Boeing blindside. In 2000, when Airbus was finalizing the A380 design, they made a critical assumption. Engine technology would remain essentially static for the next decade. They had assurances from engine manufacturers that no major improvements were coming. They were catastrophically wrong. Former Airbus sales chief John Leahy later admitted, Airbus was blindsided by the engine manufacturers in 2000. Our program people had assurances from the engine OEMs that there was nothing on the horizon with better specific fuel consumption for years to come. And three years later, when we had not even delivered the first aircraft, GE and Rolls had engines with 15% better fuel efficiency that they were bringing out for the 787. While Airbus was building the ultimate hub and spoke aircraft, Boeing was creating the ultimate hub buster. The 787 Dreamliner could fly point to point between smaller city pairs that had never had direct service. It was smaller, more fuel efficient, and perfectly aligned with how American Airlines wanted to operate. Between 2000 and 2007, American and United Airlines bought nearly 600 Boeing 777s combined. They were already committed to smaller, more flexible alternatives before the A380 even entered service. The market had moved on. The cargo rejection. Want to know how thoroughly American Aviation rejected the A380? Even cargo companies walked away. FedEx and UPS both initially ordered 10 A380F freighters each. Both canceled their orders. UPS COO David Abney was blunt about why. UPS now understands that Airbus is diverting employees from the A380 freighter program to work on the passenger version of the plane. We no longer are confident that Airbus can adhere to that schedule. This is significant because cargo operations are actually more forgiving of the A380's limitations. Freight doesn't care about passenger amenities or frequent schedules. But even cargo operators concluded that the aircraft's size and operational constraints weren't worth the complexity. What this really reveals. Here's what's fascinating about this story. The A380 wasn't a bad aircraft. It was an excellent aircraft designed for a specific model of aviation that simply didn't exist in America. The A380 succeeded with government-supported airlines operating single mega hubs in geographic positions, ideal for connecting continents. Emirates, owned by Dubai's government, connecting Europe, Asia, and Africa. 
Singapore Airline, linking Southeast Asia to the world, British Airways, channeling traffic through London. These are models that couldn't exist in the deregulated American market. U.S. airlines are privately owned, compete intensely on routes and schedules, and operate in a market that rewards operational flexibility above all else. The A380 represented the pinnacle of regulated era aviation thinking concentrate everything for maximum efficiency. But American aviation had evolved beyond that. Deregulation created a market that valued choice, frequency, and point-to-point -point connectivity over hub-and-spoke optimization. The ultimate vindication. So were American Airlines right to reject the A380? The numbers speak for themselves. Airbus delivered just 251 A380s over 14 years of production, never recovering the $30 billion development cost. The program ended in 2021. Meanwhile, Boeing sold over 1,578 7s and 777s to airlines that prioritize flexibility over capacity. Used A380 values collapsed to just $40 to $60 million by 2025. Airlines that bought them are struggling to find operators willing to take them. Even cargo conversion programs are limited because the aircraft's size restrictions remain problematic. American Airlines, United, and Delta are operating some of the world's most profitable route networks using smaller, more efficient aircraft that can serve diverse airports and adapt quickly to market changes. They avoided the A380's operational constraints and positioned themselves for long-term flexibility. The Bigger Picture this story isn't really about one aircraft, it's about two fundamentally different philosophies of aviation. The European model, exemplified by the A380, prioritizes efficiency through concentration. The American model prioritizes flexibility through distribution. Both can work, but they require completely different market structures, regulatory environments, and operational approaches. The A380's failure in America wasn't about poor execution or bad luck. It was about trying to apply one aviation philosophy in a market built around its opposite. What's next? As we look toward the future of aviation, this lesson becomes even more relevant. New aircraft programs need to understand not just technical requirements, but market structures and operational philosophies. The A380 story shows what happens when engineering excellence meets market mismatch. American aviation's rejection of the A380 looks prescient today. While other airlines struggle with oversized aircraft they can't efficiently operate, American carriers built networks around flexibility, efficiency, and customer choice. They saw the future more clearly than anyone realized. The queen of the skies never found her kingdom in America, and now we know why she never could have. What's your take on this aviation mystery? Did American Airlines make the right call, or did they miss out on something special? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you found this deep dive into aviation strategy fascinating, hit that subscribe button for more stories about the decisions that shaped our flying world. Until next time, keep looking up.